Oh, hello. <laughs> I did I did something uh, stupid now. <laughs> I actually accidentally you have to start the the transmission in two places. First you start it in OBS and then you start it in YouTube. So <laughs> that was uh, that was a bit clumsy of me. I guess we'll have to go back to the beginning then and I have to restart the lecture. I'm really sorry about that, but yeah. You you live and you learn. Let's do a reboot. The fourth, f fourth, uh, fourth uh, lecture in uh, in building acoustics. Let's go back to the beginning again. Well, uh, consider that a little warm up then. <laughs> I was talking here for like <laughs> for ten minutes. Thank you, Isaac, for writing in the chat. Otherwise, I maybe I would have done the whole lecture and nobody was. I hadn't started the. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. No worries, no worries. Uh, I I think that it's like this because I have a I haven't done this before. There are many new uh, quirks and things. Perfect, it's working. Great. Thank you for letting me know in the chat. It's ve very valuable for me to see that you, that we have some some uh, communication and feedback here. That's perfect. Uh, anyway, I I believe it's like this. I don't really know how much time these lectures take when I do them in this live streaming format because it's the first time for me but but uh, I, I think like this I mean nobody can stay focused for two hours straight I mean that's not that's inhuman I mean you can stay focused for 15 minutes to an hour perhaps if you push it but then your mind starts to drift away so I think it's a really good way of doing the lectures like this that we live stream them they are recorded and uh, then you can go back and you can even you can pause it and you can continue when you have got some rest in your head and and uh, also another very valuable thing especially for you guys who are going out to become structural engineers because maybe in a couple of years from now you're at the building site and you come across an acoustic problem and you're like what did he say back then in those lectures? How how what was that thing with sound insulation? How did it? Yeah, let's check it out on YouTube because these lectures will be there. I won't take them down. They will be there all the time. So you can use them as a reference in the future when you need to refresh your memory about this. And I think if you invest a huge amount of time and money in an education, I mean the least thing you could expect is that you that you have the material accessible to you when you finish. I think that's a really good thing. Anyway, I'm going to move on and I take a little small catch my breath for a couple of minutes in the in the middle and then I just continue until I'm finished and we'll, we'll see when that is. So uh, it will probably go into overtime, but you just take a break and come back and and finish the lecture when you when you have the possibility. So, first I want to talk about resonance. And this is a phenomena that we come across all over the place, all over in the world. For every every single object we encounter has certain resonance frequencies. And what what's meant by resonance is that sound or vibrations amplify themselves. It's like you you put a little 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 bit of energy inside a system, wh which could be just about anything. Uh, it it could be the your chest, for instance, is a is a resonant cavity, for instance. So uh, when when you excite with about sixty hertz, that's the resonance frequency you can hear when you do like the gorilla, like this, boom, boom, boom. And the sound guys at the concert they know this, so they can tweak the bass drum. So when when they do that boom, you can actually feel it in your body, and that's because they they tweak. <laughs> get the resonance frequency of the chests and you use it to your advantage. So it's a cheap little trick, but it works really effective. And you get strong amplification when you are at the same frequency as the resonance frequency. So this is, that's why it's really important to avoid noise and vibration sources close to the resonance frequency. We don't want that. It could be, for instance, that you have a washing machine that is uh, doing the centrifugal program. Then it's going to rotate with uh, a cer certain RPM. And uh, then you don't want to put that machine on a floor 
which has the same resonance frequency as the rotational frequency of the um, washing machine because then it's going to get a lot of sound in 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 that room and and in adjacent rooms as well i want to show you my favorite little thing here which is uh a little mass spring system that I made for myself with a couple of rubber bands. It's uh, just the ones you buy in the grocery store. Uh, two of them. And then there's this little case which I got from an old computer mouse. And I put inside it uh, s my slinky spring, which is a bit heavy, and my keys. So we got some mass inside this one. So I'm going to move back a little bit so it's easier to see. If I now release this, it's going to start bouncing up and down. And do note now the frequency of this oscillation. I'm gonna let me just put it in the middle so it won't shake as violently. So now we've got a smooth movement. The frequency that this one goes up and down, this, this is the resonance frequency of this system. And it depends on the mass, and it also depends on the stiffness of the springs. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove one of these springs and make it softer. So look at what happens with the, with the resonance frequency when I do that. It's much slower. Because now we have a soft spring. And when we take it back... Yeah the frequency increases. So the softer the spring, the lower the resonance frequency. And then there's another way of doing it. If we change, let's change the mass. We remove the slinky from the, from the little bag. Like so. See now it's uh, it's much faster. I don't think I can do it much lighter than this because then we won't get any it's just going to bounce around crazy. But the same thing goes here. Stiff spring, we make it a little bit softer. Now it's just one rubber band. And here you can see how it goes up and down in a certain res resonance frequency, dependent on the mass and the spring stiffness. So when the stiffness of the springs go up, the resonance frequency increases. And when it becomes softer, like so, the resonance frequency goes down. Oh, let me can we focus. Yeah, perfect. And also with the mass, something that has a low mass gets a higher resonance frequency. Whereas when the mass increases, when it becomes more heavy, you get a lower resonance frequency. If you just comp just do a little thought experiment, if you if you lift uh, you know those blow up balls that you play with on the beach and then you compare it to a very large watermelon. They're about the same size, but the, but the mass is going to differ considerably. And then you try to shake them violently. You can easily shake the light ball, which is just filled with air. But when you do the same thing with a big watermelon, it's going to be quite difficult because it's so heavy. And this is something that we come across in acoustics all of the time. All the time. So... Uh, let me just grab a little water. I have... Uh, where's... There we have it. I've prepared a little experiment here that I want to show you regarding this. Because, uh, like I said, we get sound vibrations that amplify themselves and we get strong amplification when, we're, when we have a noise source and a vibrations noise source that is close to the resonance frequency of, of some kind of system. In this case, I want to demonstrate this to you by using a guitar. So this is the guitar here on the floor. And uh, this is also kind of a mass spring system. And in this case, the mass is the thickness of the strings because they, are, they have different, st different thickness. And if you're a guitar player, you know that the thicker the string the 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 pitch goes down so it's a lower frequency the thicker the string gets 
but you can also change the stiffness of the spring by uh, tweaking the you just retune the knobs and then you can change the tension and that's one way of changing the spring stiffness so what I have here is that I put a Bluetooth speaker on top of my guitar which is uh, also like a shaker so this one it vibrates it's a little, little it's a protective plastic there but if you can see it it's a little piston here that goes up and down so when we put this one here on the guitar it starts I can shake it with my little app that I have on my phone so I'm just gonna start the app here yeah it looks like this and then when I do a tone I set it to 110 Hertz here which also 110 Hertz is about the same frequency as the as the A string so look at what happens now when I when I start shaking 110 Hertz let me put this one here it's gonna be much more visible <laughs> can clearly see how much the A string is vibrating but the other strings they are they are silent so this is the only one because this one has an a resonance frequency that corresponds to the excitation frequency so what what if this what if this was the floor slab and this was the washing machine or what if this was uh, the separating construction on top of a bedroom and this was the ventilation unit in the fan room above? That would, bo that would not be nice because then as soon as that equipment started working it would, it would excite the floor construction which would start vibrating like crazy. And you don't want to do that. You, you have to take care so, so you don't have that they don't coincide with each other, these frequencies. Now I'm going to move upwards to 196 Hertz, which is about the same frequency as the G string on this one. And you can see what happens then. see how the G string is vibrating like crazy but the other strings are silent so that's why it's really important to to take this into account and try to make sure that your noise sources and the corresponding resonance frequencies that you have nearby to them that they don't coincide that can that can create a lot of problems just put this one back in the charger so we the wireless camera it takes a lot of battery from my phone <laughs> but it's kind of cool so what we can do with this is you can also look at it in this little beautiful picture where they have modeled the whole human body as a combination of different mass spring systems so you can see here you have like the the head has an axial mode of 25 hertz the eyeballs have uh, resonance frequencies between 30 to 80 hertz and and so on and so forth chest wall 60 hertz yeah that's what i was talking about earlier with a with a kick drum from the sound engineer at the concert it's like boom 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 you give it a little boost by 60 hertz with a kick drum and you feel it in your chest but and uh, and then you have also the different limbs and the hands and everything. Of course, if you have a heavy hand, it's going to have a lower resonance frequency. And if it's a small hand, it can vibrate really fast. And the same goes with the legs and the feet and stuff. But anyhow, let me tell you a good little story about this. Because a couple of years, a couple of years ago, I uh, went to this uh, test drive where they had Harley Davidson motorcycles. And they have huge twin engines with the very large cylinders so it's quite a lot of mass that is going up and down in that v-twin and and they they it's you have it between your legs that engine so it's uh, it's, it's the same as, as this uh, figure that we're looking at 
and I have an excitation f- frequency in from the saddle up into my butt and into my spine and then into my head. And what happened that when I was approaching the red lights that are cross- crossing and I stopped by the red lights, because first I've only been brum, 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 just driving along, but as soon as I came to standstill, then something really strange happened. The the RPM of the engine goes down to idle speed and it's like it's quite a low idle speed and that idle speed excitation corresponded with the resonance frequency of my eyes so so what happened is that my whole vision was just completely blurred out I could not even see if what the traffic lights were saying if it was red light or yellow or green or nothing I didn't know what was going on because they eyes were shaking so badly inside my sockets and w- what is this and yeah wait a minute it's the resonance frequency of the eyes because i'm an acoustician so i i did that little connection so uh, and then i started revving the the engine a little bit and when i increase the frequency my eyes stopped shaking just as with the example here on the guitar that i had on the floor that when i changed the frequency the a string stopped shaking but then another string started shaking instead so that's what i did when i use the throttle I can control the excitation frequency and when they did not coincide my eyes I got perfect vision so that's why I have a little hypothesis that sometimes you can hear Harley Davidson users uh, riders that they boom, 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 like when they're standing at the red light so maybe it's just because they want to see better to see when their lights go on <laughs> so it's green so they can boom, go could be that anyway let's move on a mass spring system, we look at it mathematically. And then we have when the excitation frequency, that's F in this case, and then FR is frequency of resonation, of resonance. So you have when F is below the resonance frequency, it's only stiffness controlled. You you have no no effect, no isolation. So let me put we're gonna go back to this one and take a look at it. We'll put the mass in here because I think it's a bit more clear with that one so when it's when it's controlled by stiffness when you're below fr it's it's uh, okay so this is the resonance frequency if i excite this system with a frequency that is lower than the resonance frequency you see nothing happens down here it's just moving together with this one up and down but it's when I increase this frequency. So if I move my hand at the same frequency as this, about this speed. So if I do the same speed with my hand, I get a st- strong amplification. Yeah, it's, it goes all over the place. Because I, I put in a little, little, little bit of energy up here. And I get a huge amount of movement, of displacement down here. So here you got strong amplification. And then you need, the only way to reduce this movement is to introduce some kind of damping, to damp this system. And that, that's, uh, if, if it would be, um, if we were building a wall, we would add mineral wool to the wall, because you still have the resonance frequency, but at least you can dampen it. And uh, it's the same thing with, uh, with a car. If you look at the suspension on a car, it's not just a spring, because then it would be bouncing like crazy. You also have this uh, container, the cylinder with a spring, which can have some kind of oil in it to make, uh, what's it called, viscous, the viscosity of the oil affects how fast this can move. And th- that's a form of damping as well. But we keep moving up. So when, when we are above the resonance frequency with our excitation frequency, then the mass starts to come into effect and we get isolation. So uh, you first we had this horrible movement. But if I now increase, look at what happens here. When I increase the resonance frequency of the excitation, we have no movement. And this is what we want to do when we design buildings to get proper sound insulation. We want to make sure that the frequency of excitation is well above the resonance frequency. Because then we will have this, then we will have isolation. 
We do not want this. This can be very problematic. And if you are below, then nothing happens. Then it's like all the energy that I put, put in up here comes out on the other side. But with, with good isolation, it works like this. And then, of course, by, by changing the resonance frequency of the system, like we make it a, an even softer spring. I have to go back a little bit. This one, when the resonance frequency is very low now, this means that you get isolation on a broader frequency spectrum when it's like this, because it's still not moving, even though I slow down my ha with my hand considerably. Here is when it starts to get some displacement. But I can move the hand quite slowly. Whereas with a stiffer spring, this yeah, you see now we don't get isolation because now we get movement instead down there. So this is what this is a major part of our daily work as acousticians. So the important terms are I excitation excitation frequency. The the rotation speed, typically, if you have equipment. It could be a fan, it could be a washing machine, or any, anything like that. You know, when you're driving your car in the winter, perhaps, you felt like it's g -g 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 like so. You can measure the frequency of these oscillations in the, in the steering wheel. It's because you get an imbalance. You, you have like a, a little piece of snow or ice on the, on somewhere on the wheel. And when it's rotating fast, quickly, when you're driving along, it's going to start shaking violently. But then again, if you if you increase or low or uh, lower the speed, the uh, frequency of these they will slow down when you slow down the car. And then you have the resonance frequency, what we can also call it uh, eigenfrequency. I'll I'll try to stick to to resonance frequency perhaps. But if I if I say e eigenfrequency, I'm I'm referring to the same thing here. So here's just a, a, a conclusion about this. If you have a mass spring system, the resonance frequency increases with a stiffer spring and it increases with a lower mass. And it decreases with a softer spring and it decreases with a larger mass. So what we want to do, we typically, we want to get it as low as possible because then we get maximum isolation. But the drawback is that you by adding mass yeah things start to become more clumsy and more expensive and uh, you introduce other kind of problems a and also uh, it usually requires more and more space so there's always this um, you have you have to make a compromise between what is economical and what is uh, what is good enough sound insulation because you it will cost you money to to create the analogy of a softer spring or increase the mass. It's uh, In a wall you can have one layer of gypsum or two layers of gypsum or three layers of gypsum. That's how you change the mass. Yeah, I mentioned this before. If you have an undamped mass spring system, the motion will just continue forever because it's, it's just amplifying itself up and down with this system. But in reality you always have some heat energy that is created in the spring and you get some air molecules that are, that are creating air resistance. So you you always have some damping. But if you want to model it, you would do it like this. You could use this uh, uh, liquid container. If if you're you know when you're uh, when you're um, in a boat and you're rowing your boat with the oars. If you're if you're pulling the oars slowly, then you have you don't have as much resistance, but if you try to move it really fast, <coughs> the water is going to give you resistance. So let's take a look at the analogy with a wall, because now we're moving into your territory here with the structural engineering. So the spring, that corresponds to the air gap in the wall, and the thick air gap the, the, the distance between two plates. The thicker it is, the more flexible it is, which gives you a softer spring. Whereas a thin wall, it's, uh, it's not as flexible because it doesn't have anywhere to go. We can't compress the air in the same way. 
And then you have the mass, which is like the surface mass of wall plates. And the heavier the surface mass, the lower the resonance frequency. So that's why we sometimes when we have uh, acoustic problems or when we ha want to achieve very high sound insulation, we add several layers of gypsum to increase the mass. And then finally we have the damper, which in this case would be the mineral wool, the sound absorber that we put inside the cavity, inside the wall. So it's, uh, it's a good analogy. And then, when we 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 might need to uh, we want to calculate how uh, should we uh, design our system so that we make sure that we have sound insulation, and this is the critical critical way of of calculating it. The excitation frequency must be at least square root of two times higher than the resonance frequency to achieve uh, damping. Or uh, maybe I should have written uh, isolation. B bad translation there. We, which we want to be at least a factor of square root of 2 above the resonance frequency. Let's see, we got some comment here. Structural engineers, we design floors so that the resonance frequency is always higher than 8 hertz, the walking frequency. Yeah, that's a good example. And if you Google about a bit on YouTube, you can also find these good examples about regarding the walking resonance frequency. You know, when they have a bridge and, and if uh, the military parade is walking across the bridge and everybody is going in sync like this, that can be really dangerous. I mean, th there are some, uh, some uh, clips there where, where bridges that have failed catastrophically, where, where they, th the bridge started resonating and it broke, t tore itself to pieces because the, the movement became so, so large. And, and this is also a thing to consider when you design a floor. Make sure that you, are, that you have this into account, so you don't get this uh, uh, uncomfortable, unpleasant, flexible feeling in the floor. This is what it, what it would look like to achieve damp uh, isolation. Square root times the resonant frequency should always be less than or equal to the frequency of excitation. If we look at this in a graph, it would look similar to this. You, you plot the displacement on the y-axis and then the frequency on the x-axis. So the displacement would be how far did this thing move from its equilibrium before it shift the direction and go to the other one. And that's when you when you have uh, when you're at the resonance frequency, you get maximum movement. Oh, see, it looks like there's one of the here is is gone. Yeah, but I guess it's just it's the it's the peak. It's when when the when when you're at the resonance frequency, you get maximum displacement amplification. I mean, th th this is a bit counterintuitive. Like if, you, if you have a washing machine that you have a problem with, because the neighbors are complaining, then maybe you want to put some uh, elastic layer in between, I don't know, maybe something like this, or with a little spring or something. Th they have different colors, these ones, and a different color corresponds to a different stiffness. So for, uh, for example, this green one is, is quite soft, whereas the, the, the black one is, is really stiff. So it's designed to take a, a, a heavier mass. But anyway, this means that you can actually make things worse when you put some elastic interlayer beneath the washing machine. <laughs> because you, you then it you end up in that amplification region. And that, that means it would be bet you would be better off by just putting it bang on the floor. So you want to make sure that you end up in, in this region here. Make sure that the excitation frequency is, is up here. Then you will get a damping. Okay, so this was the, a quick rundown of the basic physics that and mechanics that are going on. Now we're going to move on to airborne sound insulation and look at uh, technical solutions. See, how, how do we construct and build our, design our buildings to get good sound insulation? 
I'm going to start off now by talking about lightweight walls, which is like typical when you have you have plates and you have beams or studs that connect them. And you can also add mineral wool to increase the sound insulation or several layers of gypsum. But let's look at some um, typical examples here of what they can look like and their performance. So here you have two walls, just single walls with um, one layer of gypsum on each side, 95 millimeter studs. In one case is timber stud and the other is a steel stud. And you can see at the sound reduction indices that you have 36 dB when you do this uh, reference curve adaptation. And then you have uh, 32 dB if you look at the spectrum adaptation term with the increased frequency range. So you see when you, when you look at from 100 Hz, you got 36 dB, but when you look from 50 Hz, you only get 32. And that makes sense because uh, the lower frequencies can more easily go through a wall like this. Because if we want to increase the effective area of sound insulation, we need to add mass to make it go slower or make the spring softer. And in this case, that would mean that we need to make it thicker, a thicker air gap, because that's the, that's the spring stiffness, or add more layers of gypsum. So here we have two examples where we did just that. Let's put another layer of gypsum on top. Let's see, the first one was yeah, it's 95 millimeter. Oh, okay, so it's not exactly, not exactly the same, but 70 millimeter steel stud here and you have uh, two layers of gypsum on each side. And now the inc insulation increases a bit. So you get about like 40 dB sound insulation in this one. And, uh, but you only get 36 when you look at the lower frequencies. So we move on to the next one. Here you have an even thicker stud. So the air gap is increasing. The spring stiffness is going down. And that means you get sound insulation from lower and lower frequencies. And that's why also this spectrum adaptation term is now 40 and this one is 44 so the thicker it gets the better sound insulation here's another ex another example with some calculations I did yesterday now if you have first no air gap at all you just have two gypsum plates stuck to each other like this you get uh, 33 decibels in the calculation and then I introduce a 90 millimeter air gap in between. There's no connection in this model between these. They're just floating free in, in cyberspace. And then you increase to 38. Because now you've added a, a, an elastic interlayer there, the, the air gap, which acts as a spring. And then you take the same one and you introduce damping as well. And then the reduction goes up a lot more because if if you in when you introduce the damping first if you have this one uh, when it's just undamped this is this middle one in the picture the second one but if if we would add damping to this one it would be perhaps if i would have a a barrel of water and i would do the same thing with this one inside the water then you it would still want to to go in the same speed but it couldn't because the water would slow it down and that's why you would get less movement when you add the damping. So the resonant frequency is still the same, but it, it's, it's sl it slows down the movement. So let's see, what else do we have? Yeah, of course you, you can't have two flates that are floating in, uh, in cyberspace. That does not work. You need some kind of wall frame to, to mount them to. And here, here are some typical ones. The first one is a single stud. It's like a rigid connection, timber stud, 90 millimeter, with mineral wool and a gypsum on each side. And you get 39 dB sound insulation. But then there's another option and you can do a staggered stud where, where there are like e every other stud is on each side of the wall. So you, get, you can get rid of the, some of this Stru structural connection in between them. And this gives a major improvement in sound insulation. You go from 39 to 46 dB with this change. And of course, the, the thickness increases as well. 
And then you have the final one on the right, the double stud, where you have two separate wall frames with a g layer of gypsum on each side, and then there's a little air gap in between. Oh, damn, I forgot to write the configuration of the wall. But it's uh, it's a 90 millimeter stud, I think. So you get 90, 90, and, uh, and two layers of gypsum, and a 10 millimeter air gap in, in between those two. But you can see that the thickness increases quite considerably. You get a major boost in sound insulation, but the price you have to pay is that the wall becomes thicker. So when, when we're talking about dwellings, you always need a, uh, a double stud in, in the wall construction. It can't work otherwise. But sometimes when you have, like, uh, maybe it's a, a hotel room or something, you're very limited. You need to keep the walls as thin as humanly possible. And then maybe staggered stud could be an alternative to get a little more bang for the buck. It can never become as good as the double stud with a staggered stud, but it can maybe you can get close enough for the specific problem that you're trying to solve. Because with a staggered stud, it's still going to be connected in the top and the bottom. The wall has to attach to something. And there, there you get a little structural connection, which you don't have with a double stud, because then it's completely two separate frames. Here's a typical wall between dwellings. Yeah, maybe this is also like the 230 millimeter thickness. Oh, it's a, about the same one as previous. Maybe it was 90 millimeter beams in this one, I, I guess. Anyway, let's take a look at the wall between the dwellings. So here we have two layers of gypsum on each side, 70 millimeter steel studs, and a 10 millimeter air gap. So this is a typical lightweight wall. And uh, you get uh, 56 dB of uh, sound insulation from 100 Hz when you do the up and down movement of the, of the curve that we talked about yesterday. No, two day before yesterday. And then you have 52 dB when you look at the, the 50 Hz. So that, was, that used to be uh, the dwelling requirements in Sweden were given less uh, R the reduction index. Now they're given like D, but I it's very similar. So so th this one is uh, the lowest level that you want to look at if you want to design between dwellings. Now we get some comments in the chat. Let's see. Eyeball Resonance and Harley, that's how they sell these. The Milwaukeeans are blurring their <laughs> buyer's vision. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> I wonder what Harley are going to do now with the electrical engines because uh, the, the V-twin which is like an integral part of their whole company when you lose the combustion engine you don't have those vibrations anymore and, and uh, I, th I know they, they have introduced an electric model on the market but maybe they have to put some kind of imbalance <laughs> in the wheels or something <laughs> to get the vibrations back if maybe the customers <laughs> miss it <laughs> or maybe they they will think like oh wait a minute so this is how comfortable it could be when you're riding a motorcycle we'll see and uh, here are some good examples now from each of these parameters and see how they affect the total is isolation of the wall so first you have it's it's the same wall basically it's gypsum and gypsum on both sides and the only thing we change here is the beam, the, the stud, the steel stud. So it's 45 millimeter, 70 millimeter, and 95 millimeters. And here you can clearly see uh, that as the, the stud width increases, the sound reduction is improved. And these are laboratory measurements. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a real wall that I have tested. Then we move on and take a look here on the importance of the sound absorber. So have, here we have the 135 millimeter wall, gypsum and gypsum, staggered studs. And it's uh, exactly the same thickness in all cases, in the same configuration. So the only thing we do here is that we, we go from zero mineral wool and we add 
more and more and more sound absorber. And the important thing to note here is that when you look at, when you go from zero absorber to just a little absorber, from zero to 30 millimeter, you get a huge increase in sound insulation. You go from 41 to 49, and that is a lot. Because if you look at the previous lectures where we did the subjective experiment, when I had these buttons that I could click between 0, 1, 5, uh, 0, 1, 3, 5, and 10 decibels, you can go and check that one out and, and listen to it again. And you, you see that 8 decibels, that's like twice or half. So it's going to be a huge change. But then, when you keep adding the mineral wool, you get less and less bang for your buck. So you see, you when going from 30 to 70, you only get an extra decibel. And in the final one, where you completely fill the cavity with mineral wool, you get 54 decibels. And... Uh, Sometimes we end up with a situation where we, we are limited in the, in the space that we can use for our wall. But we have, have to get as much sound insulation as humanly possible. It could be like a music rehearsal room or, or something similar like that. And then, of course, we just fill it. We fill it to the brim. But normally we try to use the one that gives us the most sound insulation per um, invested uh, dollar. <laughs> Then we have frame type, and here are some different frame types. First we have the wooden wooden stud and the steel stud. And uh, you can see here that uh, when you go from a wooden stud to a steel stud, you get a slight boost in sound insulation. So I would suspect that maybe these steel studs are uh, perhaps, um, they're called like acoustic steel studs. They, they are a bit flexible. You have like the cheap metal profiles, they, they're quite rigid, but then there, there are other models of steel studs as well that have some, some flex in them. And, uh, and then you can get from the same wall thickness, 147 millimeters in all four cases, you can see that the sound insulation is improved a, a bit. Oh, well, 4 dB, that's quite a lot, when you go from the wooden beam, which is rigid, to a little more flexible uh, steel beam, or oh, steel uh, stud. Then we have the staggered studs, which I mentioned before. When you separate them, you now you don't have the common structural connection, except in the top and the bottom, with the floor and the ceiling. And then you go up to 55 dB. And then there's an interesting, for comparison here, the fourth and final one here, which you could compare to the first one. Because in all these cases, we had like a center to center distance of 600 millimeter in each of these, between each of these studs. But uh, in the final one you got 450 millimeter between between the studs. And then you lose quite a lot of decibels. You have 48 when you have 600 and you have 42 when you go to 450. So why is that? Why? Because we usually we build with a smaller distance. But the reason is here that the work environment is more important than the sound requirements because if you use with a 600 cc you will get really heavy gypsum plates and they are not fun to work with so it's much more pleasant if you have like 900 millimeter gypsum plates and work with those instead so it's a trade-off there's always a trade-off no matter wha what kind of discipline or domain you're working in or what's your specialty there's always a trade-off and the really good engineer is the one who learns how to balance these all these uh, requirements from different domains with each other and create something really awesome oh, we got some bankruptcy <laughs> yeah Harley poor Harley they add speakers to imitate the sound yeah I think it's actually coming also with with vehicles with uh, with cars and stuff that they add some some uh, loudspeakers to create it's uh, perhaps one aspect could be to get the feeling of uh, engine sound and power, but there is also a safety aspect with it, because when someone is coming with a combustion engine, you can hear them so you don't get run over, but when you're coming in an electric vehicle, there's no sound, and maybe you just walk out into the street and bam. So that's another reason for it. Let's move on to the studs. 
there is a bit of the delay with the chat here i noticed because when you write something it takes a little while before i can see it so that's that's why i'm a bit slow because you, you can do some changes when you start a stream so you either you you have uh, high image and audio quality which is the one i'm running right now or you can go for reduced quality but it will be more instant with a uh, feedback from the chat so you, li you we'll, we'll try it out as we go we'll see what happens so a timber stud wall here we have a 46 db wall 172 millimeter thickness and maybe this is not enough but then there's another option we can use from our toolbox which is called an acoustic profile which is like a special metal profile that you add uh, attached to in, inside the wall uh, and it's uh, like 25 millimeter just about the same thickness as my thumb and then you can have a massive increase in in sound insulation it's even from 46 to 555 yeah that's that's a lot that's a really good boost when you add this little thing but i also want to warn you if you're working with these acoustic profiles in the field in the coming years be very very careful with them because i've seen many costly examples where these profiles had been acoustically short circuited by mistake if you like if you put a screw and you put it straight through so that the gypsum is still rigidly connected to the timber stud you lose the effect of it or another thing is that if you if you put the acoustic profiles in the ceiling and then you add an inner wall i mean it's, it's easy to just put the s all of the ceiling inside and then you raise the inner walls but you should not do that because if you do you will short circuit the acoustic profile because then it can't move up and down then it's fixed and you will lose many many costly sound decibels in the sound reduction if you do that so be very careful with them and also be very careful when you add the acoustic profile so don't don't have any electrical installations or stuff that that are gonna go under the beam perhaps and then there's a stiff connection it's uh you have to be very careful when using them. If you mount them properly, they work very nice. And then we have steel studs. Yeah, here I have two examples with a regular stud and the acoustic stud. You can see here in the in the image how it's like a little soft thing in in the middle of the of the profile, which gives it some flex. And uh, then you can get a couple of more extra decibels. So these acoustic studs is the ones you should go for if you have a bit higher sound requirements. I think there's also suppliers who have uh, like uh, a combination of they only have one product but they 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 in integrate the acoustic features in just one stud instead of having separate studs because if you're at the building site also it's it's not that fun if you have several different types of products that you want to use in in different rooms so you, you increase the Maybe maybe you can optimize the cost when you buy the stuff, but you're going to lose on it when you try to mount it and you become confused. <laughs> so there's uh, always these things to consider. A com big compromise. Here's another one. Multiple walls. And I've written here, you should avoid this if possible. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but this is something that is really counterintuitive. By adding another wall after the first wall, you lose sound insulation. How is that possible? That does not make sense at all, but it's, it's the truth. And the thing is, if you look here at these walls, you have the same number of beams, you have the se uh, of studs, you have the same number of gypsum boards in all these three configurations. It's all the same material. But look at the sound insulation of these different walls. The final one at the bottom, you got 60 dB, and that's how you should build it. That's like a, a separating wall between dwellings, 60 dB. But then you have this one in the middle, where they have a layer of gypsum right in the middle. So it's like, it's one wall, and then you construct another wall outside it. You lose a lot of d dBs. But the first one there, where it's like actually two completely separate walls, 
this is, makes no sense to build it like that. But you, you also lose a lot of sound insulation. So how can this be? Well, remember the mass spring thing once again. It's the stiffness of the spring is critical. And what happens when you make the air gap thinner? You make the spring stiffer and the resonance frequency goes up. But you want to keep it as low as possible. So in the third wall you have a large cavity which means it's a soft spring and that one is going to work by far the best. Whereas in the, f the first two walls it's, it's halved. It's the same thing like this when you have this really soft one and you add another layer. This is what you do when you have, a, 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 we can call it a, a triple wall. A and this is also something that I've come across when they have, maybe th they, they wanted to increase the sound insulation of a certain wall construction. So they, they did an additional layer of sound insulation on the other side. But they kept the gypsum board into in the wall. And then what we have to do is we have to tear down the the the, ad the added sound insulation that they put there, and go there. And then with the what's it called a tiger saw, when you make huge hole, either you tear down the gypsum inside the wall. It's like going from wall number two to wall number three in this figure, or you can make large holes with a tiger saw and, and like it's a, a uh, open acoustic. It looks like big holes for all, all, all over the all over the wall, like so. But but you will get the strong improvement in sound insulation. And I understand it, it's uh, it's really counterintuitive, but physics you can't can't really negotiate with them. <laughs> it's a tough negotiator. So the best wall that would be to use a double stud with an air gap in between. You maximize and use as high surface weight as possible. Many different layers of gypsum. A large air gap, a large cavity width, this is cri critical. And you also add a sound absorber in, in the cavity in, inside. Now also another thing that I forgot to mention is if you look at windows, they're usually triple glass. So a, a triple glass window is a t uh, one of those uh, acoustically bad constructions. But then you have other disciplines that need to take into account. So you get good thermal insulation. Maybe you don't want to have just one air gap inside the window. But if you look closely, especially if you find a window in an apartment or somewhere where you have a glass wall with very high sound requirements, maybe it's an apartment in a very noisy part of the city, go and look at the windows and then you will probably find that you have triple glazing but you will have a large air cavity and then the, the, the second one to the third glass then it's just a small cavity. That's a way to minimize it. You shouldn't distribute it 50-50 because then you will get the worst possible sound insulation. But if you have like 90% of the air cavity on one side of the glass and you just have 10% of the air cavity on the other, then you get much better sound insulation. And also you can sometimes find in the really high quality, uh, high performance windows that they add sound absorber around the edge all around the window. You can't put it inside because then you can't see through it, but you can put it. You can put an absorber around the edge. So that's how you do it. Now I want to show you here some examples of uh, sound reduction curves and we're going to talk about a concept called coincidence, but I think uh, I, need, I need to get this little five minute to uh, catch my breath and uh, I uh, I'll, I'll yeah I'll start a timer for five minutes and uh, and we'll continue then in five minutes.
five minutes has passed. Let's move on. Okay, so here we have reduction curves from some uh, wall constructions. And you can see uh, the first blue one. That That's like uh, one of the previous slides. I c maybe I can even try this little feature if I can move back and forth. Yeah, th this one in the in the first uh, in the early slide when you just have two layers of plates attached to each other with no air gap and then you introduce an air gap. So this is like a single wall and a double wall. And then we go back to this one. That's what meant with this one. But in its case they have uh, three layers of gypsum, a zero mineral wall and on a beam. So uh, it could be a wall that they use on an uh, installation shaft or something like that. But then we see some uh, different characters here. We have a double wall resonance here uh, in the low frequency region. And this is what happens when I showed you with this, uh, with this uh, mass spring thing. Wh when, you, when you're, at, when you're below, below the resonance frequency, what you get put in here comes out on the other side. So you, you don't get much sound insulation. But then then when when you clo get in closer and closer to the resonance frequency, then you get this strong amplification. And that's the dip you can see in these curves. And now dip you have two different curves, a gray and a black one. And it's because the black one has wider studs, so it's a larger air gap. Whereas the gray one has 70 millimeters instead of 95, so it's a thinner. So the the th the thinner wall has a stiffer spring, and that means you have to go up quite high in frequency before you start to get sound insulation. And in this case, it it looks like it's here here when it starts to surpass the simple wall, you go up to 250 ish around this area. So you have to pass the resonance frequency before you start achieving sound insulation. Whereas when you have a softer spring, you can go... How low can I go with this one? Yeah, not much. Here, hey, now it starts to break down. But we then we choose the, the black wall instead with uh, wider studs, which makes it more elastic. And you see, now I can move it with the same frequency, and it's still stationary down there. So this one works in a much broader frequency range, because it's got a stiffer, it's got a wider stud, wider air cavity. And then the second one here is also, the gray one has zero mineral wool, whereas the black one has 45 mineral wool. So that's the damping. The damping that makes sh sure that the amplitude of this motion doesn't go completely crazy. Because with zero damping, you get <laughs> like this one. Look at this. It's a very large amplitude. But by adding the mineral wool, it'll, it'll move. The amplitude will go down instead. And th that's why we can, we can have a... The, the dip isn't as bad in, the, in that case. But then we also have something that happens up here. Coincidence. Coincidence frequency and, and critical frequency. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Because you see, when you, when you approach 2000, 2500 hertz area, the sound insulation is reduced. So what happens? What's going on there? The critical frequency and coincidence, that's something that happens when in airborne sound, the propagation velocity of sound in air is 343 meters per second. And this is valid for all frequencies, for low frequencies, middle frequencies, and high frequencies. It's always 343 meters per second in air. But when you're dealing with structure-borne sound, the propagation velocity of the sound varies with frequency. So you get different propagation speed depending on which frequency you're talking about. This has an effect on sound insulation 
because if the if you have different velocity it's harder for the sound to to uh, change the medium to go from a plate into air or from air into a plate or for instance so the critical frequency is defined as the frequency when the bending wavelength in the plate I think I mentioned bending wavelengths in one of the earlier lectures by the way when the plate wavelength when it's moving back and forth and pumping air when the wavelength in the bending wavelength in the plate is the same as the wavelength in air at at grazing incidence when it's coming uh, I almost parallel to the wall and you have the same wavelength in the air and you have the same wavelength in 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 the plate then it's going to be an easy connection you know if you if you've been um, alpine skiing and you're going to go with a ski lift you know if if you're standing still it's it's uh, maybe it's a bit tougher to gr to grab the the lift when it's coming but if you if you if you're sliding when you're coming and you're almost the same speed it's it's easier to 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 get off and it's uh, it, that could be a uh, ski lift analogy to the term called uh, I think it's impedance. I mean, how how uh, how the energy can be transmitted between different mediums. If you synchronize the speed, it's gonna go easier. So coincidence that's something that happens when we are above the critical frequency because there you will. There will always be an angle which satisfies the condition sinus theta equals lambda over lambda bending wavelength. And here you have the, the, the mathema mathematics to prove it. So when you have the, f the first time it happens is when you have grazing incidence, when it's coming in the same, it's almost parallel. Then the lambda is the same. It's like if you take this triangle and you just close it when theta is very very yeah uh, theta it goes up close to 90 degrees <laughs> and and the, the the this little angle becomes almost zero then these two lambdas are almost the same but but when y when you are above the critical frequency you can have an uh, angular in incidence of the incoming wave which then project down onto the bending wavelength on the plate it, i think i I did this little sketch so we can see how this works. So at the critical frequency, the, the wavelength in the plate and the wavelength in the air, it's the same. And if you look closely, you can see these purple lines as well to indicate each wavelength. But then when we're above the critical frequency, I mean, sound can hit the incident sound come to the plate from many different directions. And... Uh, when we increase the angle of incidence like this, you see that the the projection of that wave it still coincides with the bending wavelength in the plate, but the frequency here increases because the wavelength is shorter and shorter and shorter. So here, w when it's coming quite what's the term steep <laughs> incident uh, uh, towards the plate you have a considerably higher frequency but you still get this correlation between the bending wavelength and the wavelength in air so this means that as soon as you are above the critical frequency you will have increased radiation efficiency and that's what you can see up here in this area when you pass the critical frequency you get coincidence and the radiation efficiency is increased and it works both ways. I mean, if, if the radiation efficiency is increased, it's easier for sound to leave the plate and go out into the room, but it's also easier for sound inside the room to go into the plate. So when it's like uh, the sending room and the receiving room in the sound insulation measurement. Now we can move on a bit to the resonance frequency of walls. And take a look at that once again. So a lightweight wall, lightweight walls, <laughs> always has a resonance frequency of about 30 to 100 hertz. It's a good thing that I'm better at acoustics than I am at English grammar. But anyway, <laughs> if you have a lightweight wall, plate beam, plate construction, you always end up with a resonance frequency between 30 to 100 hertz in the typical dimensions that you encounter. 
whereas a concrete wall is heavier. It's like a homogeneous wall. And this is it's a lot heavier than the lightweight wall. And this gives better low frequency performance. Because the resonance of the concrete wall is outside the audible spectrum. And this is the reason that you have a tougher time dealing with lower frequencies when you're working with lightweight constructions. Yeah, here we have them as well. But I've already dealt with those, so we move on. Here are some examples of heavy constructions when you have concrete and you have the airborne sound reduction index of uh, 53 dB on a 150 millimeter construction. And then we increase the thickness and see what happens. 257, 250, 61, 363. But when you start to go above 300, you don't you don't gain much more in in sound insulation. This is not a linear approach. The thicker and thicker and thicker is better and better and better. Because di there's di di when we move on into advanced level of acoustics, there's different types of wave propagation that takes over. So, but we don't have to go into that. This is more the typical constructions that you probably will come across when you are working as a structural engineer or a building engineer. So how high can we go? For a lightweight wall up to 300 mm, we can reach about 65 dB in the sound reduction index. And for a heavy wall, 300 mm, we can also reach about the similar level, 65 dB. But we have to remember that this R'W index does not describe the low the correlation between perception and uh, <coughs> the, the low frequencies I, in <coughs> if you these ones is only from 100 hertz and up but there's a lot of things going on in the 20 to 100 hertz region as well in or at least or in the 50 to 100 hertz region and that one we miss out if we only look at r then we need the spectrum annotation term i mean just like i said if you if I scream 100 decibels into the sound level meter from the top for the top of my lungs and then I give it to my wife and she does the same, we might just end up with precisely the same decibel rating. But it sure ain't gonna sound the same. And that's because the frequency content is different. And this is a weighted number where you weight a lot of different frequencies together. So that's why it can differ. Now we move on here also to another interesting uh, thing with uh, sound transmission between identical rooms. And this also has to do with resonance frequencies. Because when you have two identical rooms, they also have identical resonance or eigenfrequencies. They're called standing waves. It's um, when you... Uh, let's Let's see. If you if you how you describe it. If you if you go into a room, and y depending on the l length, width, and height of the room, it's going to be an air volume inside this room, and and, and all these uh, length, breadth, length, width, and height dimensions will create certain resonance frequencies that are going between the x, y, and z axis inside this room. So when when you go in there and you clap your hands or you use a starting pistol and bam or you blow a balloon certain frequencies will correspond to the room dimensions and they will they will stay inside the room for a long time it's the same thing that with with when you have a, a drum kit where you have uh, depending on the size of the of the tom tom drums on the boom 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 on the drum, drum kit you get different frequencies when the size is increasing it goes lower and lower and lower in frequency but if you have two drums, they will have the same. So that means if you hit one drum, the other one is going to start vibrating, even though you didn't touch it, because it's a resonance. It it's requires a minuscule amount of energy to produce a lot of sound. And this means that sound transmission between rooms is increased due to these coupled resonances. And you, you almost always have identical rooms. Because... How else would you build? It would be it's 
it's really difficult to construct a building where the architectural drawing is different on each floor, where you the rooms are placed on different places inside the building all the time. So usually it's, it's like the living rooms are stack stacked on top of each other and the uh, bedrooms are stacked on top of each other. But you will get this coupled resonance phenomena. And another thing, if the resonance frequency of the separating construction, that is if, if the, the floor construction between the two bedrooms, if that one has the same resonance frequency as the room's resonance frequency, then will you get even further increased in, in sound transmission efficiency. Let me do a, I'm going to try to do a little example here. So we move to the mobile cam. And what I've had done here is that I've, I've prepared, let's see, maybe I'll do like this instead. I've prepared some wine glasses here. It's not because I'm thirsty, because I'm interested in the sound that they produce. Something like that. So here we have three glasses. They look pretty much the same. But they have they are they are they are they aren't the same because they have a little bit different the um, size and shape of them are slightly different. So for instance, if you listen to this one, uh, I don't know if the microphone can pick them up, but I hope so. So you can hear that uh, these two have different pitch, and this one has water in it because no three glasses uh, no two glasses that had the same pitch i couldn't find any but these two were kind of close so what i did is uh, that i uh, just going to check so i got everything here perfect yeah what i did is uh, that i filled some water in this second glass to change the pitch so that it would be you can hear maybe they're the same so these two would be like two identical rooms then that are adjacent to each other and then what happens here th uh, let's see if this works if I do the glass harp thing here This is the glass that is starting to vibrate because I mute this one. I, I now, now this is completely silent. I do it once again. No sound is coming from this one. It's completely silent. And then we grab some water on the fingertip and we, then I'm going to start making noise with this one and I'm going to kill it. And then we're going to see what happens here. I hope the microphone could pick up this sound because it's really clear here. This one starts vibrating instantly. And let's see what happens with the other one then. They are all dead now. Nothing. Not a single sound from this one because it's a different frequency and then you don't get the connection. This is actually the same thing that happens when you have uh, something that is called parquet resonance. Because when you have a parquet flooring in, in a dwelling, you, you put the parquet on, on a little elastic layer, and, and then, then there's the same distance between the parquet and the, 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 the floor below on, on in each room. And then you get this wine glass phenomena. That's what par what's called parquet resonance. Because when you... When you walk on the parquet in room number one, you will create this excitation of the resonance frequency of the parquet. Because if you, if you were to hit the parquet, you could probably hear uh, it has a certain tone. And, th and th the parquet in the other room requires almost no energy whatsoever to start vibrating in the same frequency. Just like these two wine glasses. I mean, it's... it's 
it's it's not loud, but it's it starts straight away. I wish I would. I'm, I think I'm gonna try to s do some more with this experiment. I heard you could put like a you know the the straw when you drink the soda. If you put one of those inside this one, I think I could even make it start bouncing around. But I couldn't find a straw, unfortunately, today. Okay, so let's move back to to the desk. Grab some water here. I want to show you here some uh, pictures now before we leave sound insulation and go on to uh, airborne sound insulation. We're going to move on to impact sound insulation, but here are some pictures that I found of some acoustic problems where they had a wall pass through with the electrical installations is a uh, lecture room to lecture room and and here you can uh, can see it, it, it's quite a large hole that you produce in the wall and if you just leave it like this you will get a lot of sound transmission through in the form of yeah it's it's leakage so you you need to perhaps build a box with gypsum from a distance out from the wall maybe a meter or something and you put mirror wall inside and you do it on both sides of the wall then you can depending on the size of the hole, but uh, that's one way of solving it. And here, here's another one that I found. This is a really large hole. It's all, all over, from, from, the, from the ceiling to the, to the what's it called, the, the cable ladder, <laughs> and all the way from to the next wall like so. So, so it's quite, quite a large hole, this. And if you just put mineral wool, mineral wool in a hole that is this size, then it's basically it's, it's you're only talking through a mineral wool, and that's the same thing as if I was talking like this. I mean, it's if you if I just put some cloth in front of my mouth, you can still hear me. So that's the reason you would need quite a thick mineral wall of mineral wool before it would even approach the sound insulation of a concrete wall like this. Well, here, here's all some other wall pass-throughs. They put some foam in them to make sure that they are airtight. So this was considerably better than the last one. Now we're going to move on to impact sound insulation and look at some technical solutions here. So this is a concrete floor slab of different thickness. We got 100, 160, 200 and 300 millimeter concrete. And you can see it's, it's basically like a parallel shift of the of the curve, because when we're when we're dealing here with the uh, impact sound level, it's uh, lower is better. So the thicker the concrete, the lower the sound level becomes. So this is what we have to deal with. Without it's just raw concrete. There is no treatment on the surface. And with that configuration, you'd end up with like 77 impact sound level on 200 millimeter or 72 on uh, 300 millimeter. So this is absolutely not enough to do a dwelling, for instance. So we need to add now another layer of something that can reduce impact sound from walking and, and scraping and stuff like that. And then you can get some impact sound improvement from these different configuration. So first you have like raw concrete, then you have no improvement because that's a reference condition. A parquet with elastic interlayer can give quite a lot, 20 to 25 dB. The zero is if, if, if you just use the parquet without the interlayer and just put it bang on and maybe even glue it down, then you won't get any improvement because it's a solid rigid connection. So it's like banging straight on the on the raw concrete. But with the elastic interlayer, you get a proper sound reduction. Then you have carpets. Depending on the thickness, you can get a little to a lot from those. Especially at the high frequencies, of course. And then you have a wall-to-wall -wall carpet, which I believe is an English term for Hale Technics Matta, which can give you 10 to 25 dB. You can see them in offices, for instance. So they, they are really good at reducing impact sound. 
and then you can also use a floating floor with elastic interlayer when you have like a, a screed on top of something that is elastic and then you can choose whatever kind of surface you want and still get really good sound insulation so this curve shows is like the first one but it shows now quite clear that if you have raw concrete and then you add uh, like a linoleum carpet on top that's quite a hard yeah like it's like the one i have i have it right here in in my little office room this kind of carpet i mean it's it's a bit flexible it is and now i mean in this case it's not relevant because it's just a wooden construction floor with no neighbors but if if this one were used for a, for instance in a in a lecture room or in a school or something you would you would get some reduction in it but but not that much but a little a little at, le at least but there are some uh, carpets that are like acoustic linoleum carpets which can give a, a, a good sound insulation the the drawback is that they become softer and then you will have furniture imprints when they've been standing on them for a long time and and stuff like that and that's why a hard carpet would be preferable to get more mileage out of it but anyway if you have a carpet like that like the linoleum it's it's quite hard which means you only get a little bit of reduction up in the highest frequencies up here whereas a textile carpet then starts to happen it it rolls off quite a lot but one thing is same for all these cases and that it, it doesn't really help down here in the low frequency area and this is really important to remember i mean if you have a low frequency problem with your impact sound insulation you cannot solve it with a carpet it just doesn't work because it's uh, it's too thin it, wh what happens is if you want to have insulation let's go back to this fellow again this is the area you're in when you're walking on a thin carpet everything that you put in up here comes out on the other side you don't get any insulation that way you want to be in th in this area when the frequency goes up you get sound insulation and this is another example of it here's this uh, illustration of a floating floor where you have concrete construction, you use some elastic interlayer, and then you put a screed on top, poor jutning. And the beauty with this one is that you can use now, the architect can choose freely, you can put whatever kind of floor system you want on top of, of, of this one, because you take the impact sound further down in the construction. But the drawback is that this one is, uh, it, it costs height, it's thicker, but it's, uh, it can be a really effective solution. Here's another example of a floating floor. It's uh, Aprobo Decibel 3. D DB3 is uh, it's also an, uh, no, I don't have it here, but uh, it's a less elastic carpet, which you then you can put your screed on it and then choose freely what you want to have up here. But you also have to be careful w with the boundaries so that you don't put the screed and then the screed pours over the edge and makes a mechanical short circuit. That don't go there. <laughs> make sh always make sure that you separate these ones. And this is also another thing. When I'm talking with, with builders and uh, structural engineers, when, when we talk, when we say that it's, it's separate, we mean it literally as acousticians, whereas uh, on the other uh, engineering discipline, they may it's, yeah, it's like 95% separate, so it's separate. But from an acoustics point of view, we, m we really mean it. It's, it's really important. I wonder if I have... Give me a sec. I'm going to see if I find this little... I have a demonstration thing. But I don't really remember where I put it yes I found it I found it here this one is this one is perfect it's uh, like this one happy birthday to you there's not much sound coming out of this one 
But as soon as I... <laughs> I put it on my... On my desk. Let's go to the phone instead. It's, it's more easier to see. Here you can see what happens when you get a connection. And it just needs to touch. So that's what I mean. Why it's really important to make sure that it is separate. I, m I really mean it. <laughs> Then we have here examples of how you can improve sound insulation. If you want to add some additional sound insulation on a concrete construction, here's how you could do it. You uh, have the, the old concrete wall and then you put up a new stud, a new frame system and a double layer of gypsum. But the important thing here is that it should not touch. You need an air gap here. Because if this is connected, you lose a lot of sound insulation. It's... Uh, Catastrophic. You have to get it a bit out. Yeah, we got some in the chat here. Yeah, core composite underscreed materials. Yeah, there are diff many different, many different uh, suppliers of, of of these systems. We could take a look into. Here's um, a floor slab. Where you need to use some some kind of uh, elastic uh, resilient ceiling. It it cannot be a rigid connection and just mount the gypsum in the in the in the ceiling. You you need some kind of of resilient connector in between. And I mentioned it before also, but like with the acoustic profiles for instance. But you have to be very careful so that you keep the ability to move. If this is rigid, you got problems. Okay, so let's move on now to my favorite, technical solutions in wooden buildings. I'm going to show you some systems, some examples, and some challenges. CLT, cross-laminated timber, that is something that is coming. It's coming s really strong now. The the volume is increasing from 7,000 cubic meters to 200,000 cubic meters in just a few years. So there's going to be a strong push here from the producers. I think I saw some numbers on the Swede Swedish market in 2019 was like 700% increase of CLT production in one year. So it's a uh, it's, uh, really exciting system to to work and see what we can do with it. Because it's, uh, it's like a big... A big plywood, basically. You have several layers of, of uh, glue lamb that you can put like this. Three or five or maybe even up to nine. I don't know exactly how many you can do, but you, you get really nice wooden elements that you can c use to construct your building. And then you have also beam elements. They work very good when implemented properly. And you can also use combinations of beam systems and CLT. And uh, why not uh, CLT and concrete hybrid? All these uh, systems have their strengths and their weaknesses. And uh, we, we one key issue with sustainability that I think we need to be aware of is that we need to be we need to use the right material in the right place in the building. For instance, the foundation is likely that you prefer to do it in concrete, but the inner walls you could easily build in, in wood. So why not do it? Because we're going to have some uh, issues with uh, the CO2 emissions, of is of course one of them, but uh, 
the sand, the easily accessible sand of good quality is also running out quite quickly. So uh, I think there's already countries that are feeling it quite badly. I think Vietnam is one of them. There, and, and the perfect example is uh, in Dubai, Burj Khalifa, world's tallest building. It was built with, built with sand that was imported from Australia. Right in the middle of the desert and still they couldn't find any sand that was good enough. That says a lot. So here are some different building systems. You can look at like plate elements and uh, in situ construction. You, you build it in the field more or less cust custom made buildings and here you here you have some examples of these uh, beam elements and uh, also yeah, this one is a good picture which shows CLT elements and how you can connect them to each other you o often use these elastic interlayers these strips in between to reduce the flanking transmission I, I think I mentioned it in the third lecture as well the importance of the flanking transmission because if even if you have a very good directly separating construction that won't help you if the sound can go freely through the flank and you can also use volume elements this is something that wood uh, is uh, really good at because it's lightweight you can put it on trucks and you can drive it to the building site and then you just like, like Lego you stack it on top of each other and you can quickly erect a complete building and they can be produced either with uh, plate beam plate systems like this left picture here or there are also volume systems with the uh, CLT which would look like like this second one here's a common solution when you use CLT you can use like an installation floor system which uh, is a soft elastic interlayer on each of these little pillars that takes care of the impact sound insulation and then you have uh, the, the floorboards on top of that and you fill the cavity with mineral wool and the beautiful thing with this one is that you, you can you can often route all of your installations inside the floor and that, that also that the builders they can work from the top down that's uh, nicer than to have to work over your head because that's a much more tedious place to put the installations so this is a, a powerful way of building but there are some things that we uh, have to be very careful with so here I'm gonna give you some of the basic guidelines of how to design a CLT building with this system you cannot do it like the one in in the picture here because here you will get a lot of flanking transmission and this will not fulfill the the Swe Swedish building code also the the examples I give here is is uh, they refer primarily to the Swedish market so it can maybe it's not certain that they are as relevant on other markets but but I I'm gonna go for my my home arena Sweden so anyway, because of the flanking transmission here, this cannot work. But you can see here, I in the horizontal direction, there is a slit here. The CLT is not continuous, continuous between the... This, is a s this wall separates between dwellings. And there's a little opening here. And you have to have that, because if this one were continuous, you would get a lot of flanking transmission this way too. From this side, it's not a problem, because you have this uh, huge additional sound insulating layer on both sides. So if it's continuous from the top, that's not a problem. But horizontal flanking transmission through the ceiling is a big issue. So that's why you need to have this little... Uh, every, every new plate for every new apartment, basically. But the uh, And the vertical one you can solve by using elastomere. So you put a little elastomere here. Maybe there are different thicknesses, 6, 12, and 25 millimeters of thickness of these. And that way you can cut the flanking transmission in the vertical direc direction. So now, with this system as it's now, this, this would work. Because now you take care of the vertical transmission here, and you take care of the horizontal transmission here. And you have to put the elastomere on the top side, primarily, because if we put it down here, 
then you would have a structural connection between these two and then sound could be transmitted out here and be radiated from the ceiling and you don't want that so that's why this is the best, ba best place to put it or you can also put one on top and one on the bottom as well but on the other hand if you need to split the CLT elements between every single new apartment that's going to be a lot of work with the crane at the building site so maybe you prefer to have continuous floor slabs and put fewer lifts with the crane but if you do that you will short circuit this transmission path and then you have to do it like this if you have a continuous CLT floor slab use a resilient ceiling so that you can then you take the sound insulation here instead in that layer and that, that can also be uh, used to route some electrical wiring and stuff like that. So you have, to, you have to take the horizontal flanking somewhere. Either you split the plate or you add a resilient layer here instead. Yeah, I did a little sketch here with uh, different configurations. So this is uh, this is a no-go zone. Th you don't want to do this because here you will have flanking in all directions. The, from from this side, it's it will be okay. Typically, when you when you do these uh, CLT systems, you have you have the CLT plate on one side, then you have the air cavity with mineral wool, and then you have gypsum boards on the on this other side. So that's where you get the sound insulation. You cannot just use the the plate because then you don't get the enough low frequency performance you, you need this double layer construction but instead of two gypsum boards here you have a very thick uh, CLT plate instead but this means that on, on this side the vertical is not a problem so that's why this could be a preferable solution if you if you uh, have a wall like this and you have the stairwell on, on this side and the apartment on this side because in the stairwell you don't need the vertical sound insulation but in the apartment you definitely do so try to orient the wall so that you have this additional layer on the side of the apartment but sometimes you have these walls between apartments and then you get this situation so on this side it will get good sound insulation but this won't be good enough and even if you put the elastic uh, the resilient ceiling here you still get the problem with this flanking transmission but we need to consider all paths and th this one is seems to be quite common I've, I've seen it in, in several projects by now where, where you have the elastic layer on top and you have uh, resilient ceiling here you have the the dotted lines that means that they are okay where the the full lines are bad so this this is a way to go and make make sure that you consider all these transmission paths. So the challenges it's uh, really to deal with a with a flank. So even if we have a, a a very good calculated value of a, of a separated construction like this, when you add the flank, <laughs> you lose quite a lot. So it's, it's b back to this issue with uh, uh, the chain is never stronger than the weakest link. That's where it's going to break. Here's another example with uh, some student dwellings. And in this case we had a CLT plate. You got uh, 30 at least of elastic layer and then a, sc a screed 40 millimeters. And then you have an air cavity on the on the lower side in the ceiling, 100 millimeters, which is decoupled, and then maybe a 15 millimeter fire gypsum down here. So we see the calculated was uh, 67, but the field measurements was 56. So calculations usually overestimate what what you end up with in practice. And the calculated horizontal was 56, but then measure was, yeah, quite similar. And here they, they used a 6 millimeter rotoblast elastomer between up and on the top and the bottom side of the slab. 
here's another construction with a triple wall construction where you have the CLT and then you add on both sides this uh, additional layer of sound insulation. This one is uh, not that common because here you have uh, first of all you have the triple wall construction which I warned you about you should not use this because this one will have a really bad low frequency performance you can you can see it also it's gonna be super effective at high frequencies 77 dB I mean that's like crazily good sound insulation but then the spectrum adaptation when you take the low frequencies into account you lose 24 and you see the curve here it just crash down into nothing at the lowest frequencies and that uh, that is a problem when we're dealing with the Swedish dwelling building code because usually these this frequency area is um, tends to correlate more with the subjective annoyance whereas the e even if you don't have these absurd levels like 77 it's still going to be really good sound insulation in the higher fre frequencies because they are easier to stop and another drawback is that this wall becomes quite thick 310 millimeters then you will lose a lot of area that you can rent and make money from so uh, I don't think this one is that common because of, of, of per perhaps mainly because of this but also because of the low low uh, sound reduction index for low frequencies it, it will manage it will manage the BBR but with no margin the BBR is uh, the minimum requirements in Sweden from the authorities and then there's this one with a double CLT frame you have two frames of the building and here you have to split it uh, on, in all directions. So there's a, there's a slit here, and then there's a dual layer of elastomeres here. And uh, there is one thing with this type of construction when you have a double frame, and that is with this one, you can have visible wood. O most of the other ones, you have to put some kind of uh, sound, insulation sound insulation layer on it. And then you will lose the, the visual impression to see the wood. I mean, I, I, I would think it would be quite nice to have an apartment where there is just wood everywhere on all surfaces. And there are, there are uh, producers that can achieve this. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. And it, it's a really cool, cool design. But then, we, then we have to face this problem. To, to, uh, a problem. It's, it's a challenge. We can solve it, of course. Because w when you put the gypsum straight on top, directly to the CLT, you you won't gain that much of sound insulation. You need some kind of resilience, resilient layer in between, if if you want to get a, a, a proper improvement in sound insulation. But this is the only way you can build if you want to have, if you w want to see the wood. If you want to see the CLT plate, this is how you need to do it and remove the gypsum bores. But then you will probably have to have some discussions with the, with the fire consultant as well. But for the acoustics, it would be doable at least. And here's one. I, I've, I've talked about this a lot, but I can't stress this enough because mistakes keep happening all around. And you have to be really careful to avoid no, con no continuous CLT elements between dwellings. And that goes for inner walls, outer walls, ceiling. If you have a continuous CLT element between two apartments, you will have flanking transmission through that path. So the previous slides, we looked a lot at the floor construction in the vertical direction, but it's just... The same principles holds I no matter which direction you're talking. I if it's vertical or horizontal or diagonal or whatever. You always need to make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot and miss to handle the, the flanking transmission. So if this is a horizontal wall between two dwellings, this is an outer wall. Either you s put a separation 
inside the wall that separates the two dwellings. Or if you have a continuous slab, you use a resilient layer with an acoustic profile and some gypsum perhaps. And that how that one should be designed, it varies from case to case. There's no just no one size fits all solution on this one. So we, we calculate it and, and make sure that we, we find a a proper distance. You, you, you can work with a different air gap here with or without mineral wool or should you use one or two layers of gypsum. Maybe you want to have some other material than gypsum and stuff like that. So, Right. Okay, so I'm out of time here but I'm gonna keep going anyway because I now I, I've done the airborne sound insulation and the impact sound insulation and those two are the very most important ones for the structural engin engineers. You need to know that stuff. But um, there are also some issues with uh, installations and traffic noise and uh, a little short thing about reverberation time in the end. So I'm going to mo move through here and we're going to go through all of these parameters that, that were mentioned previously of the requirements inside a building. So when we're dealing with installations Here's one thing that you need to think about. If you you're going to put an installation on a floating floor, you have to make sure that you have a rigid support of the elastic layer. Because this one, if you put this machine on top of the floating floor, because you see there, there is this kind of spring thing, and something elastic that it, it's resting on. And, and, and when you do this, if you were to put a machine on an elastic thing <laughs> on top of a floating floor you would actually take two mass spring systems and they then you would connect new rubber bands here and attach a second mass down here and then you can just imagine what could happen and how much things that can go wrong if this one starts oscillating and then you get an, an another one that can also amplify it even further so that's why when we have this one we have to make sure that we can get a really rigid support and then we can add the elastic layer and calculate and make sure that we get proper sound insulation because the boundary conditions here is absolutely critical to how well the design